For more than 60 years, North Carolina has prohibited public sector unions from collective bargaining. But some North Carolina lawmakers are actually mulling the idea of repealing the collective bargaining law. Our next guest is is urging caution on a move like that. He says it would cost North Carolinians big time. Terry Stoops is the Vice President for Research, the Director of Education Studies, the author of a new report on this issue, and he joins us now to talk about it. Terry, welcome back to the show. Thank you. You did really extensive analysis of extensive modeling on different scenarios of what would happen for North Carolina if the law on collective bargaining were repealed and if that were made legal. Tell us what it would cost. Sure. It would cost between $889 million and $1.3 billion. And the reason why there's a range is because there's different ways to collectively bargain. Uh, some collective bargaining laws uh, do not have uh, rules that make, the, uh, make it binding for the parties to collectively bargain for um, their pay and benefits. And then there are some where it is binding, and of course that would cost a lot more. So it would really depend on the scope of the law that the the General Assembly would pass uh, and and sort of the parameters that they would establish for the collective bargaining law. Now, most of the laws that have been proposed to get rid of the collective bargaining prohibition simply um, get rid of the line that says you can't collectively bargain if you're a public sector employee. Uh, But I suspect that if that were to occur, then there would be more added to the legislation that would perhaps change the cost of uh, the potential cost to the state of allowing our public sector employees to bargain collectively. We're talking about 60 years here of prohibition on collective bargaining. So I guess the question is really, why now? Why is North Carolina now a target not only for unionization efforts, but for collective bargaining efforts? Well, there's a belief, and and this belief has actually been around for, for decades, that if you turn North Carolina into a union state, then you can turn any state into a union state. We're really a bellwether for uh, unionization. We have one of the lowest rates of uh, private sector unionization in the nation, and we're, we're often identified with South Carolina as being places where unions have the least fortune. Uh, so that is, that's certainly one area where I think that there are national groups, national unions, and employee associations that are looking at North Carolina and thinking that there could be inroads here. And if you look at what happened in 2018 and 2019 with the Red for Ed movement, uh, these were walkouts coordinated by the North Carolina Association of educators where thousands of teachers and advocates came to Raleigh to uh, protest the General Assembly, there's a belief that that might be a signal that North Carolinians are ready for public sector unionization uh, to expand. Uh, and, And the way to expand that, of course, would be to allow collective bargaining. What you just brought up is really interesting because the North Carolina Association of Educators calls themselves an association, but they have been moving closer and closer to that line of union. Um, They are the state affiliate of the biggest teachers union, right? That's right. And they want to be called union. They uh, have advertisements that say, join our union. So there is a real push to not only identify as a union, but to get the powers that unions have. And one of the the most uh, obvious powers that unions have is to collectively bargain. Uh, And that is something that they seek. And that's something that is really part and parcel with their efforts to get certain individuals elected uh, to public office is to make sure that that they have pro-union legislators and council of state members that will be there to begin dismantling uh, North Carolina's wise prohibition on collective bargaining for public sector employees. So elections have consequences, as, as we all know, but this is just one more aspect of what potentially we could see in North Carolina should the legislature, for example, um, turn on its uh, political ideology and and the leadership there. Right now it's under Republican leadership. If it turns to Democrat leadership, things could be different. You know, your report is really interesting because um, it's not limited just to looking at the education 
construction sector in North Carolina. You explore um, the whole field of unions. Help us understand the union situation in our state. Sounds like we've got private sector unions, public sector unions, but collective bargaining is something different than that. Yeah, the collective bargaining that we're talking about is for our public sector employees, which are mostly uh, teachers and state employees, and th- and there are some other sectors in the public uh, with firefighters and police. There are some some uh, employee associations there. Uh, so so that's really the the dynamic that we're talking about. It's more than just teachers. It's it's public employees in general, and there's really two mechanisms by which. Uh, the cost of uh, of the collective bargaining prohibition uh, repeal would would impose itself. The, the first, of course, is that the public sector employees would uh, bargain with their employer. Uh, you know, you think about what collective bargaining is. It's a negotiation between the employees and the employer uh, dealing with working conditions, salary, and benefits. But the other part about it, and this is something that I, I highlight in the report, is the accumulation of political power. That's that's really where the, the cost increases uh, arise because as these unions get the ability to collectively bargain, they are able to accumulate more money and then secure political power that allows them to later on uh, accumulate more money from their employers. This is something that's distinct from the private sector where it's all about bargaining with the employers and there's really very limited benefits to accumulating political power if you're a private sector employee union. If you're in the public sector, it means everything to make sure that not only do you have the ability to collectively bargain, but you use that money to uh, elect people that will continue to feed the beast, to continue to feed money to the union members and to provide more expansive benefits and, uh, and, and improved working conditions. And of course, once that occurs, if that does occur in North Carolina, that is so difficult to claw back once um, that bargaining power has been instituted and the political power has has built up. And that's one reason that you're highlighting all of this um, in your report. It's called Big Government, Big Price Tag, Collective Bargaining Equals More Power to Unions and Higher Costs for North Carolinians. Talking about political power, Terry, I thought it was fascinating in your report. I'd encourage folks to go to johnlock.org and read this. You talk about the history of unions in North Carolina. And interestingly enough, it was actually Democrats in North Carolina who were behind the push to outlaw collective bargaining. Yeah, that's right. And uh, first, when you look at the history of unionization in North Carolina, people believe that there hasn't been much unionization. But if you look in the earliest 20th century, for example, private sector unions were pretty powerful. Uh, and they're in the textile industry uh, and, and various industries, especially in the western part of the state. So unionization has been part of North Carolina's history for a long time. But looking at the public sector unionization, uh, and the prohibition on collective bargaining, that was coordinated uh, by a Democratic uh, member of the General Assembly from Mecklenburg County who was fearing that uh, Jimmy Hoffa would uh, organize the police in Charlotte. And there were some efforts to do that. The courts got involved. And rather than uh, it try to do something in the courts, they just said, we're going to ensure that this can't happen through an act of the General Assembly. And in 1959, they passed that. 